Any time? Mm -hmm. Or I'm just waiting. Stand by. Go ahead. So then, then I was flung a hundred years into the future by Fritz Lang when I saw his mighty masterpiece, Metropolis, and around that time I also saw a Siegfried, which had a flame-breathing dragon in it and a cloak of invisibility, and all these strange, offbeat, uh, unnatural and supernatural and futuristic things really appealed to me. And finally, on October 1926, I saw my first science fiction magazine. It was Amazing Stories, which had appeared in April of that year. And I was so attracted by that cover, wondering where in the world that strange, gigantic crustacean creature came from, that I uh, inveigled my mom into giving me a quarter to purchase it. When I got inside, when I look back on it as an adult, I wonder how much I could have understood of it, because here was Edgar Allan Poe and Jules Verne and H.G. Wells talking about uh, comets and planets and atoms and, and things that weren't in a nine-year-old vocabulary. But I had a very inquisitive mind. I wasn't afraid to turn the pages on a dictionary or to ask my grandparents. And so I built up quite a vocabulary, and it stood me in good stead in, in high school uh, when I took science courses. Of course, in high school, I was regarded as the resident crazy. Everybody knew that men were never going to the moon, and there would never be such a thing as television and atomic power. These were just all fever dreams, and uh, I was quite ridiculed as a kid, and it's, uh, it's a change as an adult to be invited back to the, the high schools where they once <laughs> laughed at me and wouldn't even let me uh, review a, a science fiction or a fantasy book, and to find myself appearing in cameos in movies. I was most recently in The Howling, and uh, was in Schlock and The Time Travelers, and uh, Dracula versus Frankenstein. Uh, you might think it's amusing, and it generally is, to work in such pictures, but uh, if you care to hear about it, I can, I can tell you a little horror story <laughs> in conjunction with, with Dracula and Frankenstein. Well, I have avoided, like the plague, exercise all my life. And I began to get a little bit of a bay window, and I read an ad about a little gadget you can get and roll it down on the floor, and away goes the avoir du poids. And I tried that out, and I promptly rolled my shoulder out of whack. And I was going around all night long waiting for the sun to come up. I could get to a doctor in great pain. I couldn't lie. I couldn't sit. So I finally get to him, and he gives me a shot of Novocaine. Nothing happens. Second shot, no result. He gave me one more, and he said, well, if, if this doesn't work, I've got to quit. All that happened were these two fingers dropped dead for the next six weeks. And as a, a typist, I need all ten. Well, I was going around in agony with my arm in a sling, and I got a call from a producer who said, we're doing a film called Dracula versus Frankenstein. We'd like you to play bad Dr. Beaumont and be murdered by the monster. And I said, well, I, I think I'll sit this one out. I'm in enough pain already. I can't see myself waltzing around fighting with a seven-foot, six-inch monster. I said, no, 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 uh, something new has been added. Our monster has been bitten by Dracula, and he has become a vampire. So he will just fang you to death, and it'll be very painless. So I thought, well, okay, for a hundred bucks and a little fun for posterity, I'll do it. Well, it came the fatal day. I was there at 11 o'clock in the morning, and at 11 o'clock at night, I was still waiting to do my scene. They were using a young chap who was his first professional job as a makeup artist, and he kept putting this goop on the monster's face, and it kept falling off. He couldn't get it to stick. Finally, at 11 o'clock at night, they had to have a scene between Dracula and Frankenstein, and the chap who was playing Dracula had to get the Red Eye Express and be off at 2 o'clock in the morning to New York to appear off-Broadway in a play the next evening. So they said, well, for better or worse, even if the makeup falls off in front of the camera, we've got to do this scene where the monster killed you, Mr. Ackman. Well, they put the final makeup on the monster and went to put in the fang so he could be a vampire and bite me, and they found there was such a mess of material around they couldn't fit the fangs in. So they said, well, we'll have to eliminate the vampire situation, and we'll go back to the old tried and true, uh, old-fashioned, he'll, he'll just squeeze you to death. Oh, <laughs> great, great, exactly <laughs> what I wanted to avoid. Well, fortunately, there was no rehearsal on this film, or I might not be here at the moment to explain to you what happened. 
Now, I get out of the car to my, go to my doom, Dracula's put the whammy on me, and I'm kind of a zombie, and I get out in this great big bruiser who was a uh, real muscle man, about six foot seven to begin with, and build up to be seven foot six. He grabs me and and really wasn't much acting. I was trying to, <laughs> trying to get away from him. And I realized that it didn't say in the script what was to be the eventual end of all this. So a terrible pain here in my shoulder, and I thought, well, I guess the sooner I die, the better off I'll be. So I went limp, and he slammed me down on the asphalt, and I could feel that my glasses were something <laughs> like this against the, the pavement, and I was very tempted to take a look because I was just sure that they were cracked. Well, I say, since five and a half, I'd been seeing films, and I'd noticed all my life in death scenes that they rarely fool me. I always see a little twitch of an eye or a little something going on at the throat, or I look at the stomach and I detect a little breathing. So I thought, this has got to be my Academy Award death scene. Nobody has got to say that Forey Ackerman didn't look thoroughly dead. And I was lying there holding my breath and not moving a muscle, and this went on and on. And I thought, my God, it's in Technicolor. I must be gray. I must be black. I must be polka dot or plum color by now. What's happening? Are they coming in for a Zoom shot? Or well, the director had simply forgot to call cut. He had walked away from the scene and thought I would get up and brush myself off. And there I am, just about ready to die for real. And finally, I heard my wife saying, what, what's in the whisper, you know, what, what's the matter with my husband? Why, why didn't he get up? So somebody came over to me and they tapped me and said, Mr. Ackerman, are you okay? <gasps> yeah. <laughs> and then I go to the theater and they cut my death scene short. I get out and they start oh to my. slam me down and that's it. You never saw me die. So I wound up on the cutting room floor and almost a cadaver. <laughs> well, your collection is certainly uh, not on the cutting room floor. Could you tell us something of your, your favorite items and some of the most uh, unusual things that you've collected over the years? Well, one of the most unusual, this is Bela Lugosi's own Dracula ring. He had that made for himself in about 1942. It's carnelian with an overlay of silver, and it has the vampire bat there and the huge D for Dracula. And I thought this should go with me. I went to Transylvania about, uh, I think it was August or September of 1982. And I went to various spots where the real historical Dracula had been impaling people about 500 years ago and took the ring with me and was on TV in Romania and it was photographed. And uh, they don't know too much about Lugosi, the Hungarian actor there who created the Dracula. Mm -hmm. They know more about the, the real but you know, you knew had, had some interesting stories about him, right? You knew him personally. Yeah, I knew him the last three years of his life. I was at his funeral. He had three Dracula capes, which I have one. He was buried in one, and his uh, fourth widow at the time had one. She's passed away in the meantime, and his son, Bela Lugosi Jr., has the cape. Just two weeks before he died, I was with him on Hollywood Boulevard. They had a premiere of his final film called The Black Sleep. And it was quite ironic that two weeks later he would enter the final black sleep and just two blocks away from that theater would be lying in his coffin. I recall that evening uh, we sat uh, up on the second floor because he was a chain smoker of cigars. So after it was all over, he came down. He had been in the hospital for a year. You see, for eight years he had suffered terrible sciatic nerve pains and he had uh, medicinally taken drugs for them, but finally they said, well, the, the drugs are taking too great a toll on you. We'll have to cut them out and do next best and uh, cut the nerve. It turned off the pain, but he found that he, he still required the drugs, and so he turned himself in the last year of his life for a cure. And I always regretted the way the papers treated, you know, Dracula discovered to be drug fiend and that kind of thing. He hadn't done it for kicks at all. But he almost looked like a concentration camp case at the end of his life, a very brittle, broken old man. But here he was, uh, very pleased that the public wanted him and, and seeing the premiere of his picture. Well, he was a very vain man, the utter opposite of his running mate, Boris Karloff. They made about six films together. Now, Karloff was a, a proud of his advancing years. I think if he'd lived to be a 100, he would have been tickled to death to be in a in a wheelchair or an oxygen tank, but still with us and performing. On the other hand, I figured that Lugosi probably 
fudged about five years off his age. He was said to be 73 when he died. I imagine it was more like 78. Well, he, he came down the, the stairs, and I say, being vain, he would not be seen in public with glasses. And without them, he was as blind as the proverbial bat. Uh, he, he came down, and uh, the TV people were there, and they were motioning. Uh, they wanted Lugosi over there in front of the camera. So uh, I was on one side of him, and his acolyte, a young fellow, was very devoted to him the last three years of his life and was the, the last one, I believe, to see him alive. And we said, Bela, they, they want you over there in front of the TV camera to be interviewed. And he whispered to us, and he says, boys, point me in the right direction. So we got him squared around. We said, now, Bailey, you just take about six paces forward there. And that was a, a minor miracle to see. I hope that there's a kinescope still exists on that, because here he was, unbeknownst to all of us, just two weeks from his death. And he was kind of all shriveled up, desiccated. But the world wanted him one more time. And just before your eyes, he straightened up and filled out, and he became a tall, proud figure of Count Dracula, and he strode toward the TV camera and, and did his famous thing, and I said, it's just, just a, a wonder to observe that. That is a beautiful story. You also were close friends with Boris Karloff, right? So. Well, I... Well, you had not take the I. Well, uh, I could fake it and say yeah, Boris you, and me. But I, I mean, you saw the dear gentleman ten <laughs> times in my life, and uh, on one occasion I was quite thrilled. Uh, every word that came out of his mouth for an hour, I had put into it. He did a Decca record album that I wrote called "An Evening with Boris Karloff and Friends," and when I was in the studio, he he would look at a few lines and give the signal, and then he would and that mellifluous voice with just a little bit of a lisp to it that gave him a special added attraction. He would record a few lines and, and give the signal. Well, he came to one word that he had never used before in his life. And I realized that while he had been the Frankenstein monster and a Imhotep, the 3,700-year-old dead mummy that came to life, and he had played Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, he had never been a werewolf. And I had used this real fancy pantsy word, uh, Latin or Greek or whatever it is, lycanthrope. So suddenly the spotlight was on me. How did he say lycanthrope? And I told him, and he picked it up immediately and recorded it. And then to my horror, I heard him mispronounce the name of an actor that he had appeared with on several occasions. He had been in, in The Ghoul with Ernest Thesiger, and Thesiger was uh, the mad scientist Pretorius in Bride of Frankenstein. And as many people do, uh, there, there's a mix-up between Elsa Lanchester, I always think of a chest for the lady, and Burt Lancaster. Some people will say Elsa Lancaster. And with Ernest Thesiger, sometimes they'll put an extra N in it. So Karloff uh, heard him, to my horror, say uh, Ernest Thesiger. And I thought, well, now that won't do. Uh, critics will pick up on it, and they'll criticize him. And I better speak up and let him know how to pronounce the name correctly. But suddenly I felt like the incredible shrinking Ackerman, a, a, a little kid sitting uh, in school, and, and here's the principal, and I didn't want to embarrass Karloff. So I devised a little psychological ploy on the spur of the moment. I thought, well, I'll pretend it's all my fault, that suddenly I'm, I'm not quite sure, even though I wrote the script. And I'll ask Mr. Karloff if he would be so kind as to give me both versions of the name Thess Idger and Thess Inger, and then I'll check it out and we'll be covered. Before I could do that, he snapped his fingers. No, by Jove, he said, uh, no, I, no, excuse me, I realize it's Thessiger. So he corrected himself. Well, after the hour was over, we all clustered around him, and I say nobody was embarrassed about his age because he was proud of it. So someone said, well, Mr. Karloff, we, we realize, uh, gentlemen, in your advanced years, you've performed like a man one-third your age, absolutely stunning performance. And uh, could you give us any helpful hint? Uh, how do you account for this? And he said, well, I, I don't know, gentlemen. He said, I guess, uh, I guess just good, clean living up to the age of six. <laughs> <laughs> and I uh, saw a good deal of him. Uh, he made uh, his four final films in five weeks in a little hellhole here in Hollywood. I don't know where they got the nerve to call it a studio. But he, he was in 
bad shape at a real trooper, he would arrive in his automobile and have to get directly into a wheelchair and sit with a, a tank of oxygen by his side, and he had a metal brace on a leg and I think half a lung. He was supposed to go to Mexico and make these four films, but the medico said that uh, his heart wouldn't take the 5,000 or so feet of altitude, so they, they shot half a film from his viewpoint here and then went to Mexico and, and shot everything in reverse. Hmm. Well, the dear man would sit there exhausted. I felt almost embarrassed to ask him one more question or one more autograph, but many people knew I was seeing him regularly. And it was a family who had four children, and uh, the whole family, mom and pop and the kids, would regularly sit and watch King Kong and Frankenstein and Dracula. And when the, the boys and girls knew that I was going to see Boris Karloff, they were all very keen to come to the studio. Well, the parents felt that would be a little too much, so they settled on just one out of the four to represent the clan. And uh, he was a little Korean war orphan that they had adopted, all of eight years old, little Ricky. So finally the magic moment came when he was to meet Boris Karloff. And uh, Mr. Karloff was kind of sitting in his chair, slumped and, and dozing uh, between scenes. And I went over and tapped him on the shoulder. And I said, Mr. Karloff, just, just for a moment, could you see this young boy here? And he, oh, yes, absolutely, certainly. So I said, Ricky, Ricky, you come. Well, that was a sight to behold. You would have thought that little eight-year-old Ricky was being introduced mm -hmm. to Santa Claus. He came toward him, and he was, he was trembling with emotion, and he said, Oh, Mr. Karloff, I've waited for this moment all my life. <laughs> <laughs> Karloff put his arm around him. Photographer, photographer here. I want a photo with this boy. Well, Ricky is six foot two and a policeman and married now, but I think that's the, the greatest photo of his life. Boris mm -hmm. Karloff, long gone since 1969, but with his arm around him as a little kid, and he'll never forget that. <laughs> what are some of the things you could never part with in your collection? Never part with, well, the A number one thing, if we ever have the Titanic earthquake and California cracks off and sinks into the Pacific Ocean and becomes the new Atlantis, the one thing I would grab would be a particular painting. It was October 1926 that began my whole career. I was attracted by this magazine, Amazing Stories, and the cover was drawn by an Austrian named Frank Rudolf Paul. And before he died, I went to him in New York and took this original cover that attracted me, and he redrew it, and there was a character in it which he replaced with me. So there I am for all eternity, myself, on the cover of the first magazine that started the whole thing, and the artist is dead. Other things in the collection could be reproduced, like the Metropolis robot. That took 600... Oh, okay. Okay. Sir, what is your favorite horror movie of of all time, in your opinion? Well, when asked that question, I I like two choices. Uh, one in the silent era, which would be Lon Chaney as the Phantom of the Opera, and in the talking era, uh, Boris Karloff and Frankenstein. Why? I don't even think it had anything to do with the fact that, that I was young. People might say, well, you, you were young and impressionable. But uh, even 50, 60 years later, I can see those films repeatedly. I, I think because there was really such a sense of realism about them. I spoke with Lon Chaney Jr. at one time, and he was telling me when they made The Wolfman, it was sort of like the coach uh, calling in the football team and saying, well, now look, folks, we know this is all totally absurd. There are no werewolves and, and so on, but look, let's play it absolutely straight, no tongue-in-cheek. Let's make it as believable as possible. And Lon Chaney was such a master of characterization, and my God, I don't think in 60 years or so, uh, maybe in The Exorcist, it kind of touched it in modern times and really gave me a frisson of horror, as they say. 
but but Cheney was so convincing as Eric, the Phantom of the Opera, and Karloff so convincing as Frankenstein that. Uh, uh, to me, I guess it's a matter of characterization and conviction. Sir, in your opinion, what is the difference between, say, uh, the, the audiences when they watch horror movies, mm -hmm. say, uh, in the days of uh, Karloff and Lugosi, compared to, say, the, the audiences that are watching horror movies today? Uh, when, in their reaction to yes, the... Yes, well, uh, first of all, I say it was a, a matter of suggestion versus suggestiveness. Uh, certainly in the days of uh, the Phantom of the Opera and the Hunchback and Frankenstein and Dracula, the, the Lugosi version, there was nothing the, the least bit sexy about them, no nudity, nothing of that sort. And therefore they could appeal to a much younger audience, a kid like myself, 9, 10, 11 years old, there was no problem at, at all. Uh, I feel sort of sorry in a, in a way nowadays when uh, kids who are chomping at the bit to see all of these new horror films uh, find that R rating keeps them out till they're 17 or unless they can uh, get their reluctant parents perhaps to take them. Uh, in a way, I, I feel like the, the new era of so much blood and gore and slash and uh, that sort of thing, it, it goes beyond really the horror that attracted me. It, uh, it's terror and horror and and goes into revulsion, uh, really, of these buckets of blood and blowing heads off and gouging eyes out and things jumping out of your insides and so on. It, uh, I suppose it, uh, it kind of appeals to the, the high school or the college crowd where a guy likes to take a gal who's gonna yell and scream like she's seeing a mouse or something and, and turn to his manly chest for protection, but, um, 25 years I've been bringing Halloween to the kids of the country uh, until recently when I resigned the editorship of a magazine called Famous Monsters. And I uh, find the whole generation I have raised, like Steven Spielberg and, and George Lucas and John Landis and so on, that they still kind of cling to the first principles that, that showing less can many times mean more in the way of a of fright if you just build up in your own mind what is behind that door rather than seeing some glob slopulous monster dripping green, green slime all, all over the place. Um, I think uh, the earlier audiences were less sophisticated of course, they demand more now in the in the way of realistic horror, but I, I think in, in a way that something has been lost from that uh, early virginal sort of fantasy film and uh, hopefully after we've been drowned in, in tons of blood we may get back to first principles, uh, more of an Alfred Hitchcock and uh, oh, Fritz Lang and uh, Todd Browning and James Whale sort of fantasy and horror. One last question, do you think we'll ever have the, the greats, uh, the, uh, could, could, today, could today's horror actors compare to Lugosi, Cheney? Uh, Carradine? I don't know. It's, it's something that I've worried about. I could see that our, the, the old uh, pioneers are fading away. We have hardly anybody left but John Carradine at 75, who was just honored recently, and he was asking for another 10 years, hopefully, on the screen. And, uh, of course, Christopher Lee, who was grand, but he sort of deserted the field, and uh, St. Peter, Peter Cushing is getting pretty old and, and feeble. We can't, I think, expect too much more from him. I like to see people like uh, Angus Scrimm developed, and at one time, one of the leading lights in the fantasy literary field, um, Fritz Leiber, his father before him, Leiber Sr., was in, I think, the uh, Charles Lawton version of the uh, Hunchback of Notre Dame. And I did get uh, Liber Jr. a couple of parts in pictures, but uh, nothing eventuated from that. Uh, I think we, the directors and producers need to, to look for some new uh, Cheneys and Karloffs and Lugosis and deliberately build them up if there's any hope of returning to that golden age. But, uh, I sort of have a feeling that it happens just once in a lifetime that you you have Laurie and Reigns and Karloff and Lugosi and Cheney. I, I don't know what the 
magic about it all is, but, but they exist and then it's over and, and done forever. Thank you. Yes, he just explained that. Was he moving around or anything? You were just talking, though. You... So let me get a static shot yeah. first. Uh, Hold your hand. I think it was pretty much just straight like this when you were showing it. Can you see it? The angle. There you like go. that, right? There you go. Five hundred gets five. Real tight on it. Pardon? You still get five hundred. That's incredible. The fan mail. You must be. You must oh. be the, the arch priest of horror and science fiction. All in. Well, I certainly get an incredible amount of appreciation. I uh, I get phone calls, and it it first started about twelve years ago. The first time I got a call, a voice from three thousand miles away said, "Well, Mr. Rock, I'm not even going to identify myself. My name wouldn't mean anything." And now you can but, kind of move it around the way you were doing. But I just wanted to say you made my childhood. And then he was gone, and I oh, well, nice. that gave me a glow. But sure. now that's been repeated. Okay. If I couldn't see what I was signing. Somebody over here asking a question. And 20 years ago, uh, well, when Al... I need you to sit like you were sitting before. Oh, you okay. <laughs> so we can cut it. When Al Jolson sang, he wanted the house lights turned up so he could see who he was singing to. And when I write, I like to know who it is I'm writing to, so I've always encouraged the, the kids to send their pictures in, and I publish a number of them in the magazine. Yeah, I know. Uh, 20 years ago, that wasn't enough. I decided I wanted to see the readers. So my wife and I took an 8,700-mile drive, zigging and zagging all over America for five weeks, ringing doorbells. And, and there were 1,300 kids that wrote to me if they would like me to come and visit them. One boy had promised there'd be 50 there to greet me. So in Niles, Michigan, we found one lone boy and 49 sheep on a farm. That was his oh 50 my <laughs> audience of 50. I don't think he really expected me ever to come <laughs> in. <laughs> Let me ask you, you know, you were saying it's interesting that, you know, the, uh, the generation of Spielberg and, and Lucas, Lucas and all and this, Landis were they all fans? Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, Got it.
Mm -hmm. Well, I tell you what, I'll I'll call the fellow back and tell him he should be hearing from your agent in short. Uh, yesterday in what we oh well, <laughs> that's that's a big question because TV people were going kind of, uh, I don't know who can afford or who that appeals to. Uh, it seems to me like kind of a lost cause a lot of the uh, motion turns to nothing on his part because I'd be very surprised if anybody still a single one would probably be worthwhile but he already worked on it. <laughs> Not exactly a waste of call. And Steve Spielberg was seeing a little shop.